So today we want to discover if hypersonic weapons can really change the game. And spoiler alert, they do, because they can change this into... Three years ago we made a series of videos about the theory of hypersonic flight and they are still current because that physics doesn't change that quickly. So in this video we will focus on the hows and whys because unfortunately what is available on YouTube is more concerned about pushing a narrative than understanding why things are like they are. And judging from what I have seen lately, this is particularly true about hypersonics. Well, I'm sure many already know, but it is worth clarifying exactly what type of weapons are we talking about. We are talking about weapons that can exceed Mach 5 in speed and can maneuver within the atmosphere in their way toward their target. There is nothing particular happening exactly at Mach 5. It is a conventional limit because it is a speed that current weapons hardly exceed in practice. Or better, ballistic missiles do it all the time, but they generally do not maneuver within the atmosphere. Yeah, I know there are exceptions, but let's leave it for now. Then there are two types of hypersonic weapons, gliders and cruise missiles. The gliders are conceptually similar to space planes, even though generally they are not designed to stay in orbit. They are launched on top of a ballistic missile, but rather than flying a classic ballistic uncontrolled high trajectory, they can fly lower trajectories staying in the high atmosphere. And they can make turns while flying. At that speed and altitude, the turns may have a radius of hundreds or even thousands of kilometers, but it may be enough to avoid an anti-ballistic missile sight or correct the trajectory toward a moving target, like for example a carrier. The cruise missiles are accelerated at hypersonic speed by a rocket booster and then fly under the propulsion of a scramjet engine at a lower altitude than a glider. Cruise missile has a shorter range, it should also be more maneuverable and flexible. None of these weapons are necessarily hypersonic all the time and in general their speed varies. Gliders have no propulsion so they slow down quite quickly when they enter the lower atmosphere. Depending on the flight profile they may slow down a lot or not so much. Cruise missiles may slow down for the same reason but also because they may want to maneuver more violently while closing to the target. Both may or may not be hypersonic in the critical final stage of their trajectory when they are closing into the target, but they are generally slower than during the rest of the trajectory. So basically, hypersonic weapons are very quick weapons, but why is it important to be so quick? Why near-peer powers choose to pursue these weapons rather than responding symmetrically? One of the reasons that is often mentioned is plasma. Well, plasma is an excited state of matter where electrons in a gas are free to roam around. Flying at hypersonic speed generates a cloud of plasma engulfing the weapon, then everything in the kitchen sink has been said about it. It is logical that plasma interacts with electromagnetic radiation. After all, there are plenty of free charges around in plasma. However, the way plasma interacts is not trivial. In fact, plasma absorbs, scatters, and reflects electromagnetic waves all at the same time. First communications. The plasma cloud allegedly blocks communication with the vehicle. We all know where this is coming from. This used to happen to spacecraft re-entering the atmosphere. This is true, but is not a binary on-off. Communications depend on the plasma density. Moreover, plasma, depending mostly on density and temperature, has a critical frequency above which it is basically transparent to electromagnetic waves. In practice, if the vehicle is using frequencies above 9 or 10 gigahertz, it can communicate. These frequencies may not have a very long range, but we are right in Kuban territory, which is commonly used for satellite communications. 
so you can definitely figure out a way to make it work and this issue is not very relevant. And in any case, if you want to use a frequency that is blocked by the plasma cloud, it's always possible to open windows in the plasma by vehicle shaping or the application of electromagnetic fields. You may also think of sticking the antenna out of the plasma cloud, albeit it will probably be ablated away by the end of the flight. Another point often mentioned is plasma stealth. Some say that it doesn't exist, some say that it is extremely effective, I say that I need a coffee. <sighs> Plasma stealth is not a bizarre Russian invention as some claim. It was used by the Americans on the A-12 and the SR-71 and it worked. However, lacking communication is not an on-off. Plasma reduces the radar cross-section and the reflection tends to be something like a fur ball with a tail because the ionized tail weakly reflects radar waves. Moreover, plasma is created by heat. This means that the infrared signature of hypersonic weapon is potentially huge, so it may be less visible on radar, but infrared systems may step in. For example, a space-based infrastructure could be particularly effective in spotting hypersonic vehicles from their infrared signature. So this plasma cloud is not a decisive advantage, neither is a really relevant problem. Well, it is a big issue for the vehicle design, but when it comes to communication and targeting, it's not. Have you ever heard of an OODA loop? The OODA loop is the elementary particle of human decision making. OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. That is the basic process every human decision goes through. A machine has a fixed number of parameters to consider taking its decision, exactly those it was programmed to check. A human, after having observed, can orient, that is, a human assesses what is important and what is not, if there is anything new to consider, if there is anything strange, and then take decisions based on that orientation. Obviously, it takes time to go through these stages, and hypersonic weapons are exactly designed to deprive the decider of the time necessary. One of the cases that are often mentioned go like this. The radar horizon of an antenna placed on a ship at, say, 40 meters above the water is 22 kilometers, give or take. A missile flying at Mach 5 covers 1700 meters in a second. This gives the ship a 13 seconds warning which is indeed a short reaction time, particularly considering that an intercept within the last two kilometers will likely cause a hailstorm of debris on the ship anyway. Well, this reaction time is indeed short, but probably not beyond the capabilities of the most modern integrated defense systems working in full automatic, but this is hardly a realistic scenario. A hypersonic cruise missile won't fly at Mach 5 just above the waves. Their density at sea level is likely severely limiting its speed. The acceleration stage, both for cruise missiles and gliders, must happen at an altitude where the air density is not a limiting factor. A hypersonic cruise missile will likely attack with a top-down profile, or it will descend at sea level in the final stage of the trajectory. In both cases, they will be easy to detect from long range. So completing the ODA loop in the case of hypersonic attack seems doable. Sure, these weapons are going to be more problematic to spot and track and engage than more conventional systems, but they don't seem to be really impossible. So what's the point at the end? Hypersonic weapons are an incremental improvement, maybe, but they are not game-changing. Are they? Well, not exactly. Sure you know what a bubble is. These lovely and funny things are no harm, but there is different type of bubble that is constantly in the mind of military planners. 
A2 AD bubbles is a type of air defense that covers an area centered on a specific defensive installation. In an integrated defense system, the bubbles overlap, so anything trying to enter an airspace also enters a bubble and it can be engaged. The size of the bubble depends on the kinematic performance of the interceptor, but also from the capability of detecting the target. Stealth, for example, shrinks the bubbles, opening corridors where stealth planes can penetrate and reach their target. This is what you're usually told, and it's wrong. For better, it is technically correct, but it is incomplete, and explained like this, it is horribly misleading. So let's try to unpack this. Uh, do you know what is the difference between an area defense and a point defense? No, it's not that one is large and one is small. Well, they often are, but that's not the point. A point defense system is designed to engage targets that are flying directly at it. An area defense system is designed to engage targets even if they do not fly directly at it. This means that a missile launcher in the middle of the bubble should be capable of defending, for example, this point, but also this point, or this point. Clearly, not all the points are created equal, purely for geometric reasons. For the interceptor to work, it needs to reach the target before the impact, or if firing to a transiting aircraft before it is too far to be reached. And the ability to do so depends heavily on the interceptor. A faster and longer burning missile can reach farther away in a shorter time. And also the guidance algorithm has a big part in maximizing this performance. Crucially though, the ability to defend a specific point in an area defense system is influenced by the target too. The target speed and direction have a massive influence on the area that can be effectively defended. And if you start playing with the lines and the possible trajectories, you realize that the bubble doesn't really exist, or at least it's definitely not a circle. It is more something like this. The best performance happens when the target is aimed directly at the defender, but as soon as the trajectory shifts laterally, it, as soon as the trajectory has a lateral component, hitting the target becomes more and more difficult and the range is reduced. This distance, the side reach of the defense, is roughly, very roughly, inversely proportional to the target speed, all the rest being equal. Double the speed and the range is halved. You may say, well, with enough notice, you can launch the interceptor early enough to be in the right place at the right time. Well, nobody say that the target is flying in a straight line or at a constant speed. Nobody said the target trajectory is predictable. With ballistic weapons whose speed and trajectory are easily calculated from the initial conditions, yes, this is true, you can do this, but with hypersonics, well, not so much. Sure, you can make some educated guesses about where they're going to be and launch various interceptors very early, but the hit probability is greatly reduced and you will be soon out of missiles. So, what is normally depicted like this, it is in reality more like this, and against hypersonic weapons, it is like this. Those complex, expensive, powerful systems with a very long range can now defend just themselves and their immediate vicinity. Each target now must have its own individual defense. For example, a carrier is in a good position because a missile cruiser can sail quite close and defend it, but ground targets, they all require their own defense now. And it can't be a small, medium, short-range system because the target is still a difficult one to engage. It, it must be something adequate. So, you understand the point now. You understand why a good portion of the game is changing. Against hypersonics, for now, there is no area defense possible. If you want to defend a territory from hypersonic weapons, you need a density of defenses many times higher than what it is considered sufficient now. To defend a continent from ballistic missiles, you need a dozen of sites launching interceptors. Uh, to defend from hypersonics, you need a network that is one or two orders of magnitude more numerous. 
and it is not something easy, quick and cheap to build. It is actually immensely expensive and resource consuming. Those countries that have invested in a network of air defenses, well, they have a good starting point, but they have suddenly discovered that they need a lot more. Those countries that have not invested, they will soon need to turn around, building it almost from scratch. Not a nice place to be in both cases. So at this point, I guess the question is, is this fixable? Is there a better solution? Well, yes, but only up to a point. The obvious answers are a better detection network, which is entirely possible even with today's technology, and better interceptors that are possible too. To intercept a hypersonic weapon, you probably need a hypersonic interceptor. However, we are quickly approaching what is physically possible for endo-atmospheric vehicles. A new generation of interceptors is unlikely to have kinematic performances much better than a hypersonic weapon. And if the interceptor and the target have comparable kinematic performances, then the attacker still has the advantage. Hypersonic weapons are not yet common, uh, few are already operational in small numbers, some others are being deployed, others are in a rather advanced state of development. As it stands though, the advantage is with the attacker, and I believe it is going to remain like this for a while, uh, because the proper defense will likely require a new technology breakthrough, something different from missiles. I don't know, but I am sort of fascinated by the idea of a railgun shooting shrapnels. Yeah, I know, this is going to be controversial because it is a bit different than the more common version parroted by many on YouTube. I also left out a lot of important details, but don't worry, we will come back to hypersonic weapons in the future. And please, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you very much for getting so far in the video and an even bigger thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations on PayPal. You are such a big part of what I do and I bring you all in my heart. You can also help the channel by buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I will have a small percentage and there will be no extra cost for you. Please don't forget to click on the videos that are going to appear beside me. This is telling YouTube that what I do is actually interesting. If you haven't done yet, please like, dislike or subscribe to the channel that is helping as well. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time.